and welcome to Myth Monsters. My name is Erin and I'll be your host for these little snack bite-sized podcasts on folklore and mythical monsters from around the world. These podcasts focus on the actual cryptids, folklore and mythic monsters from global mythology, rather than focusing on the full stories of heroes and their big adventures. I'll also be dropping in some references that they have to recent culture, and where you can see these represented in modern day content, so that you can learn more and get as obsessed as I am about these absolute legends of the mythological world. I'm back! Sorry, I'm a bit delayed, but technology and such is always an issue when you go on a break, and I really don't think about anything to do with the podcast whilst I am on hiatus, so it's very much a sign off and forget situation. I'm also away this coming week, although I have pre-recorded the show for next Thursday, and that'll come out when I'm at Disneyland Paris. Ah! Because I'm definitely a grown adult, but I do do this every year, so let me have it. This week, though, to kick us off into the spookiest month of the year, we are going all the way to Spanish-influenced parts of the world to look at the sometimes good, sometimes bad duende. Before I kick this off, you may see duende spelt two ways, with either a U or a W as its second letter, but it is pronounced the same way and it is the same thing, but there are regional differences, hence the different spellings. Duende with a W is the Filipino way of spelling this, and the U is the Spanish version. So, what is a duende? Well, it really does depend on where you're from with this monster. They are known throughout the whole of the Spanish-influenced world, meaning the whole of Spain, Portugal, and the rest of Iberia in Europe, as well as Latin America and Spanish-speaking Central America, as well as their conquered islands across the world, such as the Philippines, for example. Before we dive in, I'm not going to be covering the Filipino duende in this episode, as they are just a little bit too interesting and a little bit too different and in-depth on their own to not have their own 20 minutes another time. So, we will just be covering the Iberian and Latin American duende in this episode, and I'll get out the Filipino one as soon as, so you can learn about this one alongside it. But finally, let's get stuck in. All duende tend to have a couple of things in common, and are generally described as being two to three feet tall, and are usually a small old man with a full beard, pointed ears, and a large brimmed hat. They are generally known for being a mischievous house-dwelling spirit, earth elemental, or fairy folk, but can also be found outside the home in woodland and forests, with an affinity for nature and looking after their local habitats. They are known to have magical powers, but this varies by type of duende, but they are all able to see in the dark, shapeshift, and are immensely strong, as well as being incredibly easily offended. But in order to properly explore the duende, we first have to look into each different type based on their location. Firstly, we're going to stick to mainland Spain, and there are actually 14 types of duende, but a lot of them are a quick one-liner in terms of their powers, so I will go over them the best I can. We'll start with the Castilian duendes, who are described as big-headed and big-handed duendes. They live in the core of the earth, and are usually disguised as livestock or even beautiful women, and their usual MO is to break into houses, to make noise in cupboards, play jokes on humans, and move or lose objects from that home. Troanantes have the ability to make thunder and lightning, and Nubros have the power over clouds to make it hail, snow, or rain. These are obviously two that are one-liners here. Trentis are super small duendes, made up of leaves, moss, roots, and twigs, who pull down ladies' skirts to pinch their naked bums. Boscosios are similar, but are good, so they play sad songs on their flutes to guide shepherds back through forests, and will help repair barns and homes that have been affected by bad weather. Trastolillos are a bit tricky, 
and they will force wheat flour to bloom back into wheat after being milled, forcing farmers to re-mill their flour, as well as drinking every bit of milk in sight. They will also open windows during storms or cause food to overcook. However, they do always apologise, but end up always doing it again. And Nanyos Duendes are forest dwellers and guard the Duende riches from underground and will trick humans into stealing them to find their hands full of pebbles and leaves when they get home. However, they can help when it comes to finding lost things when convinced. Then we have the water-based Ventolines, who are really good duende and have big green wings and help older fishermen row their boats at sea, which is where they live. Similarly, the beautiful Ananjas, who have beautiful long glowing hair that they groom for hours and wear stardust and pearl dresses with flower crowns. They live in fountains, springs and lakes and help humans run away from Ohankanas, cycloptic monsters from Iberian mythology, which, of course, we'll cover another time. It's said when a man finds Ananha brushing her hair, he can marry her and take all of her treasures. However, if he cheats, she can leave him absolutely destitute for the rest of his life. Lastly, the most evil duendes, the Dianos, who disguise themselves as cattle or babies. They are only active at night and scare or annoy anyone they come into contact with. They are most commonly found disguised as white donkeys and offer themselves as mounts to passers-by. However, if you mount them, the donkey gets bigger and bigger, leaving you stuck on them, unable to dismount without really hurting yourself. They can also chase you as a black dog, kick you as a goat, or cry incessantly as babies. Lastly, the Trathgos are pretty horrible and are probably the most hated type of duende. They move things about in people's houses, steal things and throw things at passers-by. They also have an influence on young boys and can turn good behaved ones into naughty ones, so much so that they can turn into Trathgos duendes themselves. But now let's head over to Portugal and the Marines Islands. Duende are usually forest dwellers who attempt to tempt children into the forest when they lose their way and, of course, end up killing them of exposure. In Latin America, they do the same thing. And in Mexico, they live in the bedroom walls of unkempt children. And their main MO is to clip their toenails. However, they usually miss and take off an entire toe. Lastly, it's an honourable mention, but in the Philippines and Asia, Duende are immensely different, but have the same name and influence. They are just markedly different in regards to their history and their cultural impact, so I've decided to split these into their own episode for another time, so come back for those when it's out if you want to hear more about these ones. In general, We assume that duende eat things that we do as humans and also procreate the same way. Although, as I said with the Trascos, they can sometimes turn humans into them for misbehaving. We don't know how they die, but that's because they're spirits. It would most likely just be best to move away from them rather than thinking you can kill one off. Of course, you're most likely to come into contact with them in your own home and the best thing to do is to make sure that you respect the fair folk and make sure that you try absolutely everything not to get on their bad side, such as leaving out gifts for them, such as milk and bread. It's a great way to keep them happy and on your side in your house. Now, the etymology for this one is pretty easy. Duende in Spanish is for elf, which is a good summary of what they are in terms of European mythology, and the idea of small elves being a menace or a help. Although the word duende actually came from a phrase, dueno de casa, which means master of the house, and was created as a stark opposite to that. However, duende actually has another meaning in Spanish, 
which is a heightened state of emotion and authenticity in response to a piece of art. And I'll get onto this later in this section to talk about the other side of this word, and most importantly, that Spanish culture section. But let's go into their history. We actually have very little to go off, to be honest. We know that they would have come from Spain and Portugal rather than the invaded countries, such as Latin America, and European history pertains to fair folk for a really long time. Sprites were within European folklore since the beginning of the Middle Ages, in around 500 BC, and really started from the Middle East and Celtic nations and then spread into Germanic, French and British folklore, eventually hitting the Romantic countries in Iberia, such as Spain and Portugal in late 1100 AD. The first mention of elves though, in the context of Duendes, was in a book called Cantar de Miocid, by a Castilian lawyer per abbot, between 1140 and 1207 AD, And this book talks about Elfa Pipes, which is a Duende's cave. Later on, a demonologist, which is a legitimate job title by the way, Fray Antonio Fuentelepa, talked about Duende's and other mythical creatures in Iberia in his book, The Elucidated Entity in 1676, which talked about goblins and other creatures disappearing in the Holy Crusade. And that's a really important contextual point. Spain and Iberia were known and realistically are still known for being immensely religious, usually Catholic throughout history, hence the Spanish Armada for instance. The Iberian Crusaders were through the 11th to 13th centuries and they were liberating, I'd like to put that in bunny ears, Iberia from Islam as the main religion and converting everyone to Catholicism. Although these monsters aren't inherently Muslim, when Catholicism became the main religion throughout the region, it meant that many folklore stories were lost or demonised to sit well away from Catholic teachings. We do unfortunately see this a lot within European folklore, it is really really common with the start of Christianity. The Duende aren't 100% lost though, Thanks to their wide influence and spread to other Spanish-dominated countries at the time, on complete other sides of the world, they ended up becoming a favourite mythical monster, although the Pope was 100% not a fan. In 1933, the infamous Spanish playwright Federico García Lorca wrote Play and Theory of the Duende, which threw them back into popular folklore where they have remained ever since. As a side note, his plays are brilliant if you can ever catch them locally. I saw about four during a Spanish season when I was doing my theatre degree back in the day in Bath, so I really recommend seeing one if you can, even if they're not about duendes. His plays are fantastic. In reality though, how can we explain the duende? Well, It's the usual reason when it comes to household and land spirits, and that's because humans hear things in the night and like to personify them so they don't seem as scary. As well as that, we're not too fond of taking the blame when we lose something or break something as a species, so blaming a spirit is much easier to swallow. Livestock are unpredictable and having a branch blown at you in a heavy wind is super unlucky, but if you make it so a duende did it, it was much more likely and explainable. There are, of course, a bunch of these monsters we can compare these to. The biggest one is actually a Scandinavian monster, the Tomta, which we are yet to cover and is one of my favourite monsters of all time. These little guys live in houses and borrow your things, and then take them back to their own kind of space only to return it when you've stopped looking for it. They like being respected by their house tenants and cause mischief if you don't. And in the same vein, we have spridgeons, brownies, boggarts and hobgoblins, all from British folklore, that come really close to the same kind of monster. All being household or nature spirits 
that demand respect in return for a few mini blessings on your land. Otherwise, they wreak havoc on you and your family and your farm. I also said I would talk about duende as a noun earlier on, and the impact of this word on Spanish culture. Duende is a term that captures authenticity, that comes from people whose lives are usually full of hardship and sorrow, but also come with joy and connection to other people. So duende is actually used as a word more commonly, not as a monster, but as a descriptive word for art. For instance, bullfighting, flamenco, and even football are things that the Spanish would call duende, as they are a cultural experience from all walks of life, celebrated together with emotion and passion across all classes and walks of life. I love that this word continues culturally, and we should all take a bit of Spain's influence and celebrate duende together. To quote Garcia Lorca himself, the duende then is a power, not a work. It is a struggle, not a thought. I have heard an old maestro of the guitar say, the duende is not in the throat. The duende climbs up inside of you from the soles of the feet. But now, on to modern media. We don't actually have much on the duende themselves, but I've looked into some nature and household spirit media bits for you to go off in this section this week. But for art, have a look at the horrible painting Duendecitos by Francisco Goya from 1799, which I think is personally terrifying, but this is really the only proper portrait art of them. But go and have a look at other bits from independent artists for this monster, especially the Filipino side, it is very, very cool. In movies, we have Maleficent, Epic, The Ugly Duckling, Frozen 2, My Neighbour Totoro, The Secret of Kells, Fern Gully, The Last Rainforest, Avatar, Mavka, The Forest Song, Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, The Hollow Child, King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, Princess Mononoke, Fantasia 2000, and Wendy. For TV, we have Hilda, Black Butler, Overlord, The Ancient Magus' Bride, One Piece, Charmed, Little Witch Academia, Once Upon a Time, Return to Labyrinth, Avatar The Last Airbender, Harvey Beaks, Natsume's Book of Friends, and Power Rangers. In video games, we have one such as Two Who Project, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, Roki, Stardew Valley, The Legend of Zelda, Zork, Quest for Glory 4, Home Safety Hotline, Baldur's Gate 3, League of Legends, The Elder Scrolls, World of Warcraft, Dragon Quest 7, Story of Seasons, Lusternia, Thief, World of Mana, Total War Warhammer, Neverwinter Nights, Pokemon, and Terraria. My book recommendation this week is very short. It's for Iberian Monsters, Spanish Ogres and Boogeymen by Javier Prado Coronel for a lovely bunch of Iberian-based monsters. But now it's time for Do I think they existed? I'm going to say no for this one, but you know why though? I actually think they're a bit too vague. There are so many types of them that how can we really attribute all of these things to one type of monster? Why are Ananyas not their own separate monster? And why don't the Portuguese ones have names too? Who knows? But it's one that I just think is a little bit too far-fetched for me. I'm also someone who suffers a lot with nighttime paranoia, and I get super stressed if I can't figure out what is going bump in the night, and sometimes get proper scared too, so I'd hate the idea of a monster causing that just to be an annoyance, but I also know better, and I know it's most likely my ancient English piping and plumbing making the normal noises that they do. That's not to say that I don't like the idea of this really umbrella term of monsters called duende, I like that they all belong to this one term, but they all really do very different things. But as a folklorist, that makes them very hard to research and really put a lid on what they are. 
and what aren't Duende. Hence why I decided to do a deeper version into this side of Duende and exclude the Filipino version for now, who equally have about six different types of them and have much more detail on what they do and what they look like. And that will be covered another time. But what do you think? Did the Duende cause trouble or save people in Iberia and Latin America? Let me know what you think on Twitter about this one. An interesting monster this week that had a whole bunch of information on it, but it was all over the place and a bit of a nightmare to research. But it's nice that there's stuff from all over the world, but it does make it a bit more complicated. I hope it was worth it to know about these little mites from such a big chunk of the world's history and folklore. Damn you, you invaders in Spain. Next week, we're heading over to no place in particular and looking at a religious monster. We're going over to Islamic folklore next week to look at the terrifying demon, the Ifrit. I hope you've been good to avoid this one. And that's coming next Thursday. For now, thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give it a rating on the service you are listening on. I've got the Twitter for any questions or suggestions on what monsters to cover next, and I'd really love to hear from you. The social media handles for TikTok, YouTube, Threads, and Instagram are Myth Monsters Podcast, and the Twitter is Myth Monsters Pod. But all of our content can be found at MythMonsters.co.uk, including some very cool merchandise. And you can find us on Good Pods, Buy Me a Coffee, and Patreon if you want to help me fund the podcast too. Come join the fun though, share this with your pals, they might love me as much as you do. But for now, stay spooky, and I'll see you later, babes.